Did anybody see our EV charging stations that were out in the parking lot when you came in? How do they look? Look good, right? Very nice. They are part of a larger initiative that I'm about to tell you about. It's, um, it's one of several things that Austin Energy is doing to promote electric vehicles. So has anybody seen an electric vehicle on the road yet? Is there anybody who wouldn't know an electric vehicle when they saw one? A lot of people wouldn't. Yeah, I saw uh, my first Chevy Volt the other day just driving down the street, and it was so exciting for me as someone who lives 100% of the time in EV land. So I'm going to introduce you now to EV land as Austin Energy sees it. And I'm going to start out by talking about the EV market in general and the technologies that, uh, that make it up, and then I'm going to introduce you to the Austin Energy EV programs that we have out there. All right, so what is a, uh, an electric vehicle? There's basically... There's basically two kinds of electric vehicles out there. There's the um, all electric battery electric vehicles, that's the Nissan LEAF, and they drive 100% on electricity. They don't have a tailpipe, which is very cool. Um, the other kind is called a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, or um, as the Chevy Volt folks like to talk, call it, an extended range electric vehicle. There's actually a slight difference between those two, but it, it doesn't matter for most folks. Um, basically, the, the main thing that matters for for the, what I like to call the plug-in hybrids, is that they have both an electric motor and a gasoline engine. And so they can be your only car because um, if for whatever reason you're taking a long road trip, you can just fill up the gas tank and drive it like a regular internal combustion engine for a few days. As I mentioned before, I live in EV world. So it is, it is very clear and obvious to me that electric vehicles are coming, and in fact, they're here. But when I go out and I talk to people, a lot of times people ask questions about, well, we've seen electric vehicles come before. Most recently, the 1990s, we saw the, uh, the EV1 in California. There was a lot of ballyhoo, there was a lot of excitement, and then where are they now? They're nowhere. And so how do we know that EVs are actually here, that they're actually something that we need to be making an investment in and thinking about in terms of our transportation system? Well, this is one reason. There is a lot of activity going on around the world um, in terms of the auto manufacturers investing in this technology. The only two that, you can, that you're going to see in terms of real mass market actual cars um, as opposed to the golf cart type neighborhood electric vehicles that have been around for several years. But in terms of you know, real mass market cars, the ones that you're going to see are the Nissan Leaf, the battery electric vehicle, and the, the Chevy Bolt, which is the PHEV. But there are, are literally dozens of other cars either in production or um, in development, and we don't even keep up with it anymore because it changes so quickly. Um, but yeah, this is just an overview of the few that are, that are out there. So, how do, again, how do we know that it's real? One is that it is cheaper to drive and some people like that. Now, as you all know, they're expensive to buy and so it's a, a trade-off for folks. But this is my rough, very, very rough back of the envelope math to help you guys understand sort of the difference between driving an electric vehicle and driving a gasoline vehicle. So if you have a um, internal combustion engine and you get 30 miles to the gallon, um, with gas at 350, you're going to spend about 1,400 bucks a year on gas. Um, 30 miles to the gallon is is more than than what's average. Like um, Bobby used 21, which is closer to the overall average. But I use 30 because you're probably not going to be deciding between a Chevy Volt and an F-150. You're going to be deciding between a Chevy Volt and a Corolla. So that's why I decided on 30. Um, in comparison, if you did those miles um, off electricity based on Austin energy rates, you're going to spend about 150 bucks. And uh, MPK, I made that up, don't repeat that anywhere. I didn't want to write MPKWH for miles per kilowatt hour, but that's what that means. Uh, it, you get about five miles to the kilowatt hour for the kind of cars that are on the market right now. So if you're somebody who just doesn't like going to the gas station and you like the idea of not spending very much on the fuel, then you might be someone who um, would want to make that larger upfront investment in the car and then you know brag to your friends about how little you spent on gas this month. And I am constantly getting emails from the, uh, the early adopters who are just wanting to update me on how little they spent on electricity or on, uh, on gas or electricity last month. Okay, number two is obviously the environmental reasons. And this is again um, back of the envelope math, but it helps you, uh, conceptualize it. And, and just a word on the back of the envelope math. The reason that it has to be back of the envelope math is that performance of batteries and performance of um, 
of internal combustion engines also vary so much based on your driving habits and the temperature outside and things like that, that there's going to be no 100% perfect number because it just, it's impossible. And so if any numbers that I'm giving are a little bit different from what you might have seen elsewhere, that's probably why, and we can talk about what the, uh, the assumptions that go into them because with any of this stuff, there's a ton of, it's a brand new market, there's a ton of predictions that go into everything and it is, uh, um, you just have to decide which assumptions make the most sense. So. For, uh, for us, when we were trying to figure out what the uh, environmental benefits of electric vehicles were, we took the impact of 100,000 vehicles on the road driving 40 all electric miles a day. Um, and what we found was, as you can read for yourself, um, a 95% decrease in um, nitrous oxide and a, a slightly more than 50% uh, reduction in carbon dioxide. Now that's based on Austin Energy's fuel mix, and so that's not going to be the same if you were looking at what the environmental impact would be in California or in Seattle or in any other place. Um, we've got about a third coal, a third nuclear, and a third natural gas, and a, a, a little bit of renewables in there too. Um, and so, so for example, if we were 100% coal, if we were based in um, West Virginia or some places very, very, very coal reliant, the reduction in, in carbon dioxide wouldn't be nearly as high as it is. Um, but for drivers in Austin, I think this is a very compelling argument for, for why they might want to consider an electric vehicle um, and why we, we do think there's going to be interest. Oh, and I should add, obviously, Austin Energy is planning to move more and more towards renewables as we move forward, so the environmental profile and the comparison of the internal combustion engine to, to electric miles is going to get better and better from an environmental standpoint. The third reason is that electric vehicles just work for people's lifestyles. I mean, a lot of times, you know, again, me being in EV land, going out into internal combustion land, the question that I always get is, well, where are you going to plug them in? And I'm going to tell you where you're going to plug them in in a couple of minutes. But the main place that you're going to plug them in is at home. And here's why. The vast majority of you are driving less than 50 miles a day and about half of y'all are driving even less than 25 miles a day. So a Chevy Bolt has a range, an all-electric range of 40 miles, a Leaf has 100 miles. There's not going to be a lot of days where you're going to need to plug in anywhere but at home. And again, the fun of having an electric vehicle is not having to go to the gas station and not having to plug in other places that you can just get up in the morning, unplug, go to work, go to wherever you need to go, come home, and, and that's it. So that's another reason why it's for real, um, is that once people start adopting these and kind of figuring out how they work, figuring out how the technology is different from internal combustion cars and, and how um, the lifestyle of having one is different, it, it's going to make a lot more sense to people as not being some sort of a specialty thing that is only for condo dwellers that drive two miles a day. It really fits into people's existing driving habits. This is some data that we got from McKinsey, the uh, consulting firm, about kind of the, the range of EV customers out there. And what they found that was that about a third of the people out there are ready to consider an EV today. They're green or they are just that, I want to be the person who can brag about spending $12 on gas for the entire last six months. That, those are the, uh, the early adopters. Then there's a bunch of people in the middle who have some concerns. They, they're not really convinced by my argument that they're only going to plug in. They want to make sure that, there's, uh, that they're only going to plug in at home. They want to make sure that there's charging stations out there. They want to really know that they're not going to get stranded somewhere. And so those are um, the shapeable people, according to McKinsey. And then at the end is the person who never, ever, ever wants to drive anything but an F-150. They just really like their big cars. They think that it's all a, a communist plot or whatever they think it is, that, that there's going to be some people who are very resistant to EVs. And that's fine. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of cars out there and a lot of different kinds of drivers out there. And EVs can be a very significant part of the market, even if there's a solid chunk of people who will never, ever, ever buy them. So what does that mean for us? Um, that means that we, as a utility, need to prepare for the, uh, the electric vehicles that are coming. And so to do that, we have to get a sense of how many to prepare for. So where we are is at the very bottom of this red line, there's approximately 100 electric vehicles in Austin right now. They're just starting to trickle in. They've only been released for the last few months. And um, I think the first LEAF was only purchased about a month ago. 
So the brand new market, there's you know, practically none. Um, we expect that by 2015, about 5% of new cars that are purchased are going to be electric vehicles, either, either the BEVs or the PHEVs. And then by, um, by 2020, that that could be up to 14%. And so if, um, assuming average attrition rates for cars and that our numbers are correct, the, uh, our, our high um, prediction for the amount of electric vehicles on the road is 36,000 by 2020. So. Um, not like everybody's going to buy an EV tomorrow, but that's still a significant amount of load, particularly for an electric utility who is very concerned about, uh, as you're all green builders, so you know, we're, we're very concerned about spikes in load. We can deal with gradual increases in load fairly easily, but when you've got these kinds of, what this is is a, uh, an illustration of what an EV does when you plug it in. When you've got a spike like that, it's, it's a lot harder for the utility to deal with. And so let's just take a look at this. We call this the uh, Schreiner cap model, and it's, uh, it's how we conceptualize um, why we need to be concerned about this. So that Schreiner cap is basically a doubling of the average house's um, electric load at a particular point in time. It's not a gradual increase, it's not a nice smooth ramping up, it's you plug in and bam, you need twice as much capacity. So there's two reasons why that's a problem. One is at the local level. Um, you've got a transformer that serves your house. It turns the uh, high voltage electricity into lower voltage electricity so that you can, so that you can use it. They weren't, when we were building neighborhoods, we weren't sizing them for the top of the Shriner cap, we were sizing them for the bottom of the Shriner cap, and so we've got local capacity issues, and that's a problem for you and your neighbors. There's probably three or four people on your transformer. Transformer melts down, we have to replace it. It's not pretty. Um, but it's also a problem for everybody, even if you don't have an EV in your neighborhood, and the reason is if we get a lot of these, pipe, these spikes in demand, we have to start adding capacity. This is, especially if people are coming in and plugging in at the end of the day, this is when it's the most expensive for us to be buying um, more energy to, to pass on to our consumers, and so that is a problem for all ratepayers, and so that's a reason why. Preparing for EVs is not just good for you, the EV driver, it's good for you, the non-EV driver that pays an electricity bill. So, I'm now going to transition into the part where I start talking about um, what we're doing to prepare for the Schreiner cap. And uh, I'm going to start with just making sure everybody understands how EV charging works. So the doohickey on the, uh, the far left, that's the uh, plug. It's a five-prong plug and it's called the J1772. You can impress your friends with that. Um, the picture in the middle is what a charging station looks like. It's the same model that we've got out there, and so you can go look at it afterwards. Um, and that's the basic equipment that people are going to use. Those are, um, the ones in the middle are kind of the, the public version of charging stations. Your at-home charging station will probably be smaller than that, but that's the basic concept. There's three different kinds of charging, uh, level one, level two, and DC charging. Level one is just your basic 120. It's, um, if you have, for example, a converted Prius, it's probably already plugging into level one. It's just, you know, the plug you've already got in the garage. Level two is like a dryer plug. It's 220, 240. The difference between level one and level two is that level two is about three times faster than, um, than level one. Um, on the flip side, you're probably going to need to have special, uh, you're going to have to get the charging station put in, um, and then you, pro you might need service upgrades of some sort, so it might not make sense for everybody, because if you're, then let's imagine you're that person with the Chevy Bolt, and you drive 10 round trip to work, at 50 miles a charge hour, um, you're going to charge up you know, in, in less than an hour on an average day. So it might not be worth it to you to make the investment in getting your own home charging station. Maybe you'll just plug into the plug that's already in the wall. Um, but we think that a lot of people are going to want to invest in the faster charging and buy themselves a you know, $700 charging station. Um, and we've got some programs to help them do that that I'll be talking about in a minute. Now, DC charging is very, very fast. Um, it would allow you to fully charge up a, sh a volt in, in 15 minutes, a leaf in, in a, probably under an hour. The problem with DC charging is um, that the devices are incredibly expensive. The devices themselves are, are fifty to sixty thousand dollars, and that says nothing about even putting in the capacity, upgrading the service to put them in. So we are not consider Austin Energy is not considering them as as something that we're interested in investing in. Um, it might be something that 
that the market will demand for um, long distance travel. It might also be that when people are doing long distance trips for the foreseeable future, they just take the other car. So um, those are the kinds of charging stations are out there, so you'll probably be hearing level one, level two thrown around a lot as we move forward. So this is kind of how we're seeing, this gets back to what I was saying before. We think most people are gonna just get up in the morning, unplug their car, drive to work, drive home, have their battery probably still half full, plug in, and that's gonna be the end of it. Well, th there's also gonna be some people who have the opportunity to charge at work, and they're probably going to do that because then they will not have to pay for the electricity, and that's even more fun. There's also gonna be some days when you're not just driving from home to work and back again, you're going to the soccer game, you're going to the grocery store, you're going to wherever. And that, those are the days when you might start pushing the capacity of your battery. And so when we're thinking about public charging, that's the way we think about it, is that it's going to be convenience charging. It needs to be in places where people are going to be um, going on those days when they're not going just from home to work and back, but they're running errands. And so getting some, enough of that spread out around the town so that um, that middle shapeable portion of the marketplace um, that needs to be convinced that they're not going to run out of capacity uh, has, has the uh, safety net that they feel that they need. So, Austin Energy's programs um, are uh, designed around that pyramid that I just described. We have a home program and we have a public charging program. Um, plug-in everywhere is our public charging program. Those stations out there are our plug-in, some of our very first plug-in everywhere stations. The home program is called Plug-in Partners and I will tell you about that first. The Plug-in Partners is a home rebate program and you get up to $1,500 towards the purchase of a level two charging station. We rebate 50% of the cost of the purchase and installation up to that $1,500. Um, but here's what you do in exchange. You essentially volunteer to, to be uh, a guinea pig as we try and figure out how to address that Shriners cap. Um, you allow us to put more um, charge management devices or even swap out the charging station that you have and you share your data with us so that we can figure out the best ways to um, address this particular kinds of loads that EV is going to put on our system. So that's it, very simple. Um, Plug-in Everywhere is going to be a network of at least 100 and up to 200 public charging stations throughout the city. Uh, you will be able to access these charging stations with the low, low subscription price of $25 for unlimited access for six months. Uh, we price that based on assuming, again, we're assuming the pyramid, so we think that most people are going to charge probably about once a week, total of 40 kilowatt hours over the course of a month. So if we're wrong, we're going to change the price. That is definitely a pilot price. Uh, if you don't want to buy these six months of unlimited access for $25, you can still pay $2 an hour to charge. Obviously, you can tell which one we're trying to promote. And what we're working toward, um, because we recognize that there are going to be other charging stations that are put in by people who are not us, is that uh, any driver would be able to access any charging station in town with a single card, so you don't need the plug-in everywhere card plus the somebody else's network card plus the somebody else's network card. Right now we're not there yet, so you're, you're going to need the multiple cards for the foreseeable future if there are, do end up being multiple networks in Austin. The way that we're getting the plug-in uh, everywhere stations out there is a two-part strategy. Part of it is um, we're, Austin Energy is putting in 50 of our own. That's what the ones outside are. They're ones that we've put in. We're putting them in on city properties. We have up to 150 that are also available for any member of the community that wants to put them in. Um, it is The station itself is free for the, for the uh, what we're calling them station hosts, this third-party property owner, um, we're asking the station host to pay the installation cost, but then we take it from there. We take on the, uh, the network services so that when you run the, uh, the cost of, of sw the swipe cards and the credit card transactions, we take, that, take on that. Um, the uh, maintenance, replacement, if somebody backs over it, things like that. If people are interested in this, if anybody's working on a project and they want to get um, lead points or AE green building points, the, the EV um, stations do contribute to both of those systems, so please talk to me. The, uh, the stations are available now. We're asking everybody to get them in the ground by the end of June. 
And the initial folks who have expressed an interest, it's been interesting, um, lots of hotels, we've had several medical centers interested, property owners, by which I mean not the, the tenants, not the end retailers, but just the people who own a strip mall, for example, who see it as a long-term investment in their property, They're, they've been interested in putting it in, and uh, national retailers who have, you know, who like to do green things for their, um, for their PR purposes. So um, that is the Plug In Everywhere program. And the way that we're choosing the potential station hosts is, again, like everything else in our, in our program, this is a, a research project as much as it is trying to serve and support the EV, um, the EV marketplace. So we want to get the stations out there in as wide a variety of places as possible so that we can see where people actually do need to charge, because we have some ideas, but we don't know. And so um, the things that we're going to be looking for is we're evaluating the uh, the stations that are com the uh, applications for stations that are coming in, or we want a you know wide range of geographic locations, um, main corridors. You know we don't want it to be way off in the middle of nowhere where nobody's going to see it. Um, they're safe. Um, so safe and well lit, just kind of the obvious no-brainer safety stuff. Um, if it's going to be really incredibly prohibitively expensive to, to put in the stations, because sometimes you do need to trench through a mile of concrete to get to some location, that wouldn't be our top choice for a location because we think that at the end of the day you might not be very happy with your investment. We do care about accessibility for persons with disabilities, and then the main thing is that we want to have them close to as wide a variety of um, different uses as possible. So we want to get them at movie theaters, grocery stores, medical offices, hotels, so that we can see where people are actually charging and, and what are the uh, most high demand places out there. And then ultimately what we want is that no, no driver in the service territory ever be more than five miles from an opportunity for public charging. Um, we are actually not that far from that already just with the, uh, the city installations. And these are our city installations. Um, we've, we're doing 50 of them in 27 locations. Um, and those are them, it's city hall, libraries, rec centers, parks, um, animal services. And one of the interesting things about putting them in, because we were our own guinea pigs with the uh, public charging, um, in that when you're upgrading the service to put these in, sometimes you run into a lot of issues. But of our original 30 locations, there were only three that ended up just not working out at all. So that was a, a pretty good rate, because we had no idea what to expect when we, um, when we started putting this in, how hard it was going to be to get them in. And so usually that had to do with um, the capacity of the existing transformer. And, um, and, and then also that whole trenching issue. Sometimes the, the service is in the back of the building and you want to put it in the front of the building and you have to trench all the way around. It just gets crazy expensive. Um, but, like I said, out of 30 locations, we made it work, we're making it work at 27, so it's a, it's a pretty good rate. So that is uh, what I have to say about electric vehicles.